there's nothing to hold me Day, glorious day that 
Good evening. Good evening. Man, it's wonderful to see you all here this evening. Um, I, I just want to, to welcome everyone. And we have some special guests this evening. Uh, first of all, uh, we're here for the special ceremony of ordination for Brother Jeff Morris. And uh, so we're glad that you've decided to come and participate in that. Uh, as some of our guests this evening, uh, we have uh, Brother Mitchell Birch, who is going to be giving our sermon, and uh, we're glad you're here, Mitch, and, and his wife, Missy, and uh, Bondi Cook, uh, Reverend Dr. Bondi Cook, and his wife, Lori, and we're glad that you're here this evening. And we're also glad to have uh, Reverend Dr. C.J., what's your wife's name? C.J. Plogger and, I'm sorry, and Janine, forgive me. I, okay. I tried to go through that. We're glad that you're here this evening and to take part in the service. We're going to sing a little bit. We're going we're gonna to praise the Lord. We're just going to uh, give some worship to the Lord before we have this actual ceremony. And I'd like for you to stand, if you would, as I offer a prayer. Our Father, we've come together this evening to worship you, to honor you, and to install a man into your service. We thank you for the opportunity tonight. Lord, we thank you that we can meet freely to do this. And we thank you for your calling upon Jeff's life. Now I ask, Lord, that as we worship, we would be able to sense your spirit. Help us, Lord. And we give all that we have to you. Thank you for the victory that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together, I am a child of God.
Brother Joe Rowland is going to say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here for this ceremony today. Lord, you help me to help Jeff into the position that he is about to take. You spoke to my heart, Father. Jeff was standing in front of me one Sunday morning. I heard the shuffling of feet. I saw him struggling. He was praying to you. He was asking you to send help. And you spoke to my heart saying, help him. And I even questioned you, Lord. I said, you want me to help him? Once again, you said, help him. I took one step out of the pew. I took one step forward. I laid my hand on his shoulder. And I said, would you like to go to the altar? In tears, that man turned to me and said, yes. We walked to the altar. We prayed. And from there, you performed the miracles in his life that have taken place. We thank you that he has gone through the ministerial program. We thank you that ha you have led him, guided and directed him. And we thank you, Father, to realize that each and every one of us can play some small part in someone's life to bring them into your kingdom. We thank you for using us in your work. And we ask, Father, that we may continually have our spiritual ears open that we might hear you speaking to our hearts and minds. We ask that you will be with, with us and bless us during this service today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 You may be seated. This evening, I've, I've asked uh, our brother, Von D. Cook, if he would come and give an explanation of what an ordination service is. Uh, Von D. is the pastor of a church, a little tiny church, <laughs> down in what, what city is that in? Beckley. The Beckley is the Cross Point Church of God. Thank you. Thank you. See, I'm still new to this state. And He's been here forever. Bonnie, share with us. Thank you, Pastor Dan. I appreciate that. It's good to see you all here today. 
Uh, as of uh, Friday, I am the new credentials chair for West Virginia Ministries, and my wife Lori and I are uh, so happy to be able to come here. Uh, many of you probably don't remember this, but I was at this church when I was still in high school, back uh, around, it's the early 80s. Uh, my dad pastored in a little community called Raynell before he came to uh, the northern panhandle uh, of Moundsville and pastored there for five years. Yet, one of the things that I learned about New Martinsville was something absolutely amazing God was doing in this place. And he still is today, amen? Man, when you see men and women going into ministry in a body of believers, that says something very healthy about you, and I wanted to encourage you in that. Just to take a few moments, the process of ordination in the Church of God takes a little over three years. And Jeff had to be recommended by a Church of God pastor before we ever allow him to begin to move through that process. And he also was involved in what we call Leadership Focus. This is a national training program for pastors all across the United States. The only thing, and Jeff has heard me say this since I was one of his coaches for a semester with that program, I wish when I went through the process we had Leadership Focus. There are some absolutely amazing things and people that Jeff has been exposed to that I did not have that privilege when I went through that process. Jeff has had to write 16 different theological papers so that we understand where he's thinking, what his processes are, and so that his doctrine is sure. And the scripture tells us to make sure that we know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And in the process, the ordination process today, I want you to know Jeff has had to go through all of that. And not only has he had to go through classes where he's met with that, he's been resourced in absolutely amazing ways. But Jeff has persevered, and he has walked through that, and he wants to be true to his call. So if there's anyone here that is interested in ministry, please see me after the service. Uh, we'll walk you through that process to, to at least get you started in that because right now there is a major shortage of pastors all across the United States, not just in our tribe, okay? There are, there's a shortage of pastors all over the place. People are, I won't say not answering the call, maybe some are just not hearing. Brother Joe, like you listened when the Lord spoke to you, God's always giving us invitations. We need to pay attention to that. But Jeff responded. And that's just a little bit of that process that he has walked through with a lot of other folks across the United States. Pastor Dan. Thank you. This is a big deal. Uh, this, is, this is a very special service. Um, recognizing a man being ordained, a man or woman, um, this, this evening, we have uh, Reverend Mitchell Birch. He is going to deliver the message. Uh, the, the message is, is, to, is to Jeff as well as to all of us. Um, come on up, Brother Mitch. Uh, you may recognize him. He was here last Friday with the quartet. And uh, Brother Mitch, you can tell us just a little bit about you and the church that you're at so I don't butcher that again. And... Well... Uh, I've been in it a long time, I'll say that. Uh, not, I've been in it long, a little bit longer than Bondi Cook, uh, but not a lot longer. Um, I, I echo what Pastor Bondi said. I, I wish when I was uh, coming through the ordination process in West Virginia that we had had leadership focus and tracks of interest and tracks of um, training and education and mentors who... Um, took great interest and spent significant time in prepping us and prepping me. I, I, I had some great men around me, my dad and my uncle and others in the Church of God who uh, had served for many years, but, and they were mentoring me from a distance, I suppose, but um, nothing in any critical, critical nature, and um, I wish I would have had that. But I'm glad we have it now. Uh, when I was uh, pastoring in Washington State at Vancouver Church, one of my associates, Pastor Judy Weeks, who's now a wonderful leader in the state of Florida, um, she started through the credentialing process, and it was right at the beginning of the leadership focus. And I remember 
I don't know, Jeff, if you, you've done this or not. I'm assuming you have, but I know at that time there was a there was a, a exit exam um, for competency and uh, awareness and uh, comprehension. And uh, I looked at the exam, and I was thanking God that I didn't have to go through that. I, 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 I'm not sure I would have uh, passed it, to be honest with you. I would have, maybe I would have uh, not, not passed so, so well. But uh, I pastored for 47 years, and uh, I have been all over the country doing that. And now I'm pastoring my home church in Buffalo, West Virginia, on the Great Canal River that feeds into the Great Ohio River. And uh, I love serving my little home church. But I also love serving the Church of God in West Virginia. I was recently uh, named the West Virginia State Ministries pastor, so it falls my responsibility in a number of cases to do these kinds of things as well as help uh, stir the church and bring vision and focus and, uh, and hope to the life of the church in West Virginia. And uh, I, I'm excited about the, the new group of pastors we're ordaining in, in this season. We have, I think, six or seven that we're ordaining. And uh, I, I did another ordination service uh, down at uh, Moundsville uh, recently. And uh, there are several others yet to be ordained. One of the problems we have a dearth of leadership in the church, Church of God, as well as the Christian church around America, is because every week 1,500 bail out. Did you hear me? Every week, 1,500 pastors quit the ministry. If you amortize that 10 to 20 years in the future, we have to be producing significant numbers of called leaders to fill places and fill slots. And it's a sad, it's a sad commentary, really, but it is true. I didn't do that statistic. George Barna did. And... Uh, I, I, I'm concerned about it, very, very concerned about it, uh, but I'm thankful, as Vondi said, for this church and the Moundsville Church and other churches who are spawning leadership, who are discipling believers to places of the call of God in their lives, as Jeff has, has exper experienced that call. Today, I, I want to um, speak to you uh, and, and recognize that it is Jeff's ordination, not yours. But, um, as Pastor Dan said, these words that I will speak today are, um, are relevant and should connect with each and every one of us. I'm going to be looking at the 12th, 20th chapter of Acts, uh, and, but before we do that, I, I want to read you a, a document that I received recently. It's titled, Dear Dr. Paul. And it reads like this. We've received your application for ordination in our ministry. Unfortunately, the Board of Church Relations and Credentialing was unanimous in deciding not to accept you as a candidate for our ministry. We want to be as honest as possible so that you can address what we see as some serious deficiencies in your character and past service. First, we understand that you have never had significant financial support in your ministry labors. Working on the side to support yourself in unaccept is unacceptable to the Board of Pastoral Relations and Credentialing. If a man does not have the faith to trust God for full support, we think he's just not qualified to serve in the field of ministry. Secondly, we've heard that you have been brash and outspoken about your own views. Specifically, we heard that you publicly criticized Dr. Simon Peter and that you contended so strongly with some of our ministers that special counsel had to be convened at Jerusalem to prevent a church split. We can't condone such radicalism. We're enclosing a copy of Darius Carnegie's book, How to Win Jews and Influence Greeks. <laughs> we encourage you to read it. Also, we understand that you've not graduated from an accredited seminary we are glad that you learned a lot during your three years in Arabia, but that doesn't count. Also, in our background check, we discovered that you used to be a violent man to the point of persecuting the church. Even since your conversion, you've been in jail on more than one occasion. You caused so much trouble for the businessmen of Ephesus that it led to a riot. 
if it were an isolated incident, it might be one thing, but a pattern of causing trouble to lead, uh, to lead to your being beaten on several occasions and even being stoned once shows an underlying problem on your part, we would advise a counseling program where you could learn some basic relational skills. Our background check further revealed that you have numerous critics and enemies, even in some of the churches that you supposedly founded. Some of those critics in Corinth challenged whether you were an apostle or if you had influence there. We also learned that details about your falling out with a fine young minister named John Mark and your refusal to cooperate with Barnabas. We have talked with Hymenius and Alexander who said that you delivered them over to Satan. We believe that such extreme measures are uncalled for. A more tolerant and less judgmental approach would be more in the spirit of our gentle Lord. Apart from these serious flaws, we've heard that you are prone to preach too long, <laughs> not being sensitive to your audience. We heard that one young man, Eutychus, actually fell to his death while you droned on and on and on. <laughs> you need to get in tune with the younger generation that has been raised on TV. 15-minute sermons are the maximum that they can endure. We advise you to use more stories and less doctrine in your messages. You have considered using, have you ever considered using drama teams instead of a sermon once in a while? You admit on your application that you cannot remember those whom you've baptized. A good record keeping system would help you to be more organized. Also, your resume shows that you have never administered, ministered in one place longer than three years. This pattern of moving on to new work shows that you, you, you lack perseverance. Our staff psychologists would also suggest that it may reflect a pattern of running from your problems rather than a commitment to work through them. Of course, we share all these things out of love and concern for you. We want you to succeed in whatever the Lord has for you. But we strongly believe that you, should, you would do best in something other than ministry. The stresses of the ministry could lead to a complete nervous breakdown. Perhaps a good Christian counselor could help you begin to work through some of those problems. But we wish you the very best. Sincerely, the Antioch Board of Credentialing. <laughs> that is a spoof, of course. And it's, it's no reflection on our credentialing system. But I think it speaks to one critical issue. To be a God-called man or woman, to proclaim the truth of God, you have to have the heart of a dove and the hide of a rhinoceros. You have to be able to tenderly care and rightly contend. And that, my friends, is a delicate proposition. But in ministry over many years, I've found it to be also true. In the book of Acts chapter 20, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. It's one of the largest and longest chapters in all the book of Acts. But the book of Acts chapter 20 is a, 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 a recounting, a, a, a record of the journeys of Paul in Greece, his ministry at Troas, and moving from Troas to Miletus. And then it is a record of his dealings with the Ephesian elders, and his exhortation to them. And I'll just be referring to it. I'm not going to read a portion. I'm going to refer to it as we go. This text records Paul's last encounter with the Ephesian elders. He wanted to get to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, so he did not stop in Ephesus. It would have delayed him a bit too long. So he sent and had the Ephesian elders to come to him while his ship was in the port of Miletus about 30 miles as the crow flies. The elders were probably the pastors of the numerous house churches that were meeting all over Ephesus. Probably many of them were the original 12 men that he met with in the school of Tyrannius. In Acts chapter 19, you'll see it. The title elder describes the maturity required for the office. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul calls these men overseers or bishops which focus on their main task of superintending matters in the church. So Paul is having a, an executive council meeting, if you please. And this particular message that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus is our only example in Acts of a sermon that is addressed to Christians. 
or more specifically, to church leadership. Apparently, some of Paul's critics had been at work in Ephesus trying to undermine him as a man of God and a leader. And it comes through the, his repeatedly saying in the Acts, Acts chapter 20, you yourselves know, you yourselves know about my apostleship. You yourself know about the authenticity of my call. And his reminding them of his character and the way of life when he had been with them. He is clearly defending himself and at the same time showing us some qualities of godly leadership. And friends, in a day when many church leaders have fallen into serious sin and left the ministry, there is no greater time than for, for vitality in the church and for, for integrity in the church than today. Even if you're not a, a Christian leader and you're here today in support of Jeff and his family, every faithful Christian should be growing in these qualities that I want to share with you. Just let me name them for you. A godly leader is marked by a transparent integrity, a godly character, a faithful biblical teaching, and a servant attitude. Let me just name them again. Every godly leader is characterized and marked by a transparent integrity, a godly character, a faithful biblical teaching, and a servant attitude. Let me just break them down one at a time briefly. Paul said, you yourselves know in Acts 20, 18, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. How I was is an indicator of Paul's integrity. How I lived among you. How I worked, how I served among you. How I acted among you. He later mentions that he was with them night and day for a period of three years. Paul is here referring to spending a lot of time with these men, but I think he was also referring to his living a life openly and transparently before them. They had seen how he lived. He didn't put on a front when he was with them and then live differently when he was away from them. Paul had nothing to hide. And in this context, integrity means that you are what you are in private as well as in public. Bill Hybels wrote a book several years ago, and I'll not go into the current Hybels story, but he wrote books, a book several years ago, and its title was, Who Are You When No One Is Looking? That is integrity. If you are who you say you are when no one is observing, when the lights are not on, when you're not on the stage, when you're not in the public eye, who are you when no one else is looking? In other words, would your children recommend you to the credentials board? Would your spouse recommend you to the credentials board? Integrity. Integrity means that you're in private at home what you are in public. Your life is a single fabric. This stems from the fact that you are aware that you're serving the Lord who knows every thought and every intention and every motive of your heart. In the 1940s, there was a, a preacher named William Houston. William Houston, Dr. William Houston, served as the president of the Moody Bible Institute. An agnostic man who was contemplating suicide decided that if he could find a minister who actually lived his faith, he would listen to him. So what did he do? He hired a, a, a private detective to observe Dr. Houston. And the investigator watched him for weeks and weeks and weeks. And when the investigator's report came back, it revealed that this preacher's life was above reproach. He was for real. He was who he said he was. The agnostic later went to Houston's church, trusted in Christ, and later sent his daughter to Moody Bible Institute. Leaders must be persons of godly integrity. My question to us today is, all of us, not just Jeff, but all of us, what if an investigator was assigned 
to each of us. What would they find in the secret place? Integrity. A godly leader is also marked by godly character. Many godly qualities could be listed, but such as the fruit of the Spirit and all of those wonderful cluster of fruit, but three qualities really stand out in the text. Godly character includes humility. You've probably heard it said that as soon as you think you've attained humility, you lost it. But that's not altogether true. Why? Because Paul here mentions his own humility in Acts 20. Jesus himself describes himself as a gentle and humble heart in Matthew 11. Moses described himself incredibly as the most humble man in the earth, Numbers 12. So apparently you can know when you're humble without being proud of it. My homespun definition of humility is simply this, knowing who you are and knowing who you are not. If you can stay calibrated in who you are and not try to be someone you're not, you'll likely live a lifestyle of humility. I remember when I was starting my ministry, um, I was 16 years old, and I had been exposed to the great preachers of the movement, Bill Neese, Carl Reynolds, uh, Arlo Newell, O.L. Johnson, John Conley, uh, Boyce Blackwelder, uh, Maurice Burke was Gerald Marvel. I'd been exposed to all of the greats in that generation. And when I started my ministry, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try at this retreat or I'll try at this youth revival to be Maurice Burkquist. And if any of you, I know Bondi and CJ, these pastors know Dr. Burkquist. Burkquist was one of the most unique men I'd ever, I've ever met in my life. And Dr. Burquist, he was, he was a man of great humor, and he, he knew how to use it with absolute precision. But Dr. Burquist would come to a camp meeting, and he would, he would stand in front of the pulpit, but most of the time over to the side of the pulpit, and he never used a note. He never looked at a lyric line. He, 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 and typically he had a little pocket New Testament, and he would fill, he'd thumb through it and find something to say, and he'd read it, and then he would lay it down and preach for 45 minutes and blow your mind! I tried that. <laughs> I was in Bentree, West Virginia. How many of you know where Bentree is? Bentree is so far up the holler in Clay County, you can't even get there except by four-wheel drive. I was in Bentree, West Virginia, Church of God, preaching a revival, and I thought I'll be Morris Burkwitz this weekend. And I got up, and I didn't have any notes, and I had a New Testament in my pocket. And I pulled out that New Testament. I couldn't even find the scripture I was supposed to look for. <laughs> I absolutely bombed. I just bombed. So I said, well, I can't be Morris Burquist. And then I thought, well, I'll, 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 be, I'll be Bill Neese. I, I, I wanted a booming voice like B Dr. Bill Neese. Actually, the only thing that I have that Bill Neese had is hair. <laughs> Bill had a great head of hair. But I, I couldn't be Bill Neese. I couldn't, I couldn't exposit Scripture as an 18-year-old like John Conley. I, I, I wasn't as eloquent. I didn't have the elocution that Dr. Arlo Newell had. I didn't have the humor and the wit that Morris Burke was had. I, I didn't have the brilliant mind that Earl Johnson had. I, I just didn't have it. Somebody said, you look like the beast in Daniel 2. Gold, silver, brass, mostly clay feet. And so I had to give up on trying to be someone I wasn't and just be who God made me to be. And like it or not, that's what you get. But humility, humility is when you understand that. And you have to go through the paces sometime to, sometimes to arrive at that. In a nutshell, biblical humility, humility is a conscious awareness of your utter dependence upon Jesus. We see it in Paul when he explains in 2 Corinthians 3 and 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy, our adequacy is in God. We see it when he says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 4, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surprising greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. 
Paul confronts the pride of the Corinthians when he asks, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? A humble person is continually aware that all that he has stems from God's amazing, unmerited, unfavored grace. His confidence is not in himself, but in his Lord. So that he is quick to give glory to God in every circumstance. In the context of warning us about the deceitfulness of the heart, the Bible strongly warns us against self-confidence. True, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But listen to me. Jeff, there is a huge difference between confidence in Christ in us and confidence in us in us. Huge difference. Occasionally somebody will ask me, as they do your pastor, Pastor, do you ever get nervous before you preach? Well, I, I can't call them nerves, but I get a little antsy. Likely a little quiet trying to process and think through where I'm headed and where I'm going and how I'm going to conclude it and how I'm going to land the plane, help us Jesus. But there's nothing wrong with a few jitters. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of concern when you realize you stand with this book in your hand. It is an eternal book. It is God-breathed, God-inspired, inerrant, infallible, and you are charged with the task of making it known to the people. There's a lot to be concerned about. Well, character understands that. A godly leader depends on Christ and is quick to share his own weaknesses. I want to just pause parenthetically for a moment Jeff, I, Pastor Dan sent me Jeff's testimony. Um, I read every line, every word, every period. This man is a miracle of God. And if you know his story, you understand that statement, maybe better than others. But God has delivered him and brought him from the dregs of life multiple times to a seat on the front row at his own ordination service. Might I tell you that that is a journey, my friend. That is a journey. And it's something to celebrate. You know why? Because it tells us that God is still in the saving business, the delivering business, the healing business, the restorative business, and in the calling business. He's still there. And the gospel is still alive. And the kingdom is still operative. Amen. And there's still people just like Jeff that need to be reached for the glory of God by the gospel of Christ. Hmm. Well, godly, godly character includes love concerning compassion. These qualities are behind the, words tear, the word tears in Acts chapter, two, verse nine, chapter 20, verse 19. Paul again mentions his tears in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Let's just look at that just for a second. Acts chapter 20, verse 31, it says, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. How? With tears. With tears. I wouldn't give you a dime for a preacher that can't cry. I'm not talking about being an emotional infant. I'm talking about understanding the pain and the hurt and the predicament and the circumstances of people that he pastors and loves. And if that doesn't bring a tear to your heart, I'm not sure you're worthy to be in ministry. Hmm. I had an uncle who pastored in the church of God for many, many years, one church for 37 years. And he was a crier. He told me one time, he said, I got so annoyed with myself crying all the time. Every time I got up to testify or every time I got up to preach, I would cry. And I, I, I didn't want to cry. I, I wanted to preach. I, I wanted to have confidence. And I, I wanted to speak with clarity and boldness. And I, but I was crying all the time. I, I just couldn't keep crying. So he said, I begged God for six weeks. God, take my tears from me. Take my tears. I don't want to cry anymore. I want to preach with authority and power. 
Okay. Okay. He dried up his tears. And he said the worst of the worst scenarios would come around and I could not even feel it. I couldn't cry. I, I couldn't weep. There was no moisture on my face. And he said within a matter of days I was begging God, give me my tears back. I'll cry through every sermon. I'll weep through every song. I want my heart to be amenable and pliable and flexible so that it can be stirred when someone's in pain and my ministry can be effective. You see, godly leadership understand the compassion it takes to lead and to be followed. Paul was moved to tears when he heard of Christians who were not walking obediently to Christ, he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 2, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love that I have especially for you. Wow. That's the kind of pastor everybody wants, right? Everybody. I would remind you all, if you want to correct someone who has fallen into sin or serious error, make sure that person senses your genuine love and your concern as you correct. Thus, a godly leader is marked by a transparent integrity, a godly character that includes humility, love, and steadfastness, and trial. Thirdly, a godly leader is marked by faithful biblical teaching. Verse 20 and 21 of Acts 20. It says this. How I kept nothing, kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't shrink back from declaring to you what was profitable. This implies that there are some things that are profitable but are difficult to receive. Preachers, isn't it true? When you know your sermon is going to be difficult to receive, it's difficult to give. It would be much easier to preach platitudes. It would be much more palatable to my heart and my taste to preach just psychobabble that makes everybody feel good and smile real big and, and look like a million-dollar smile and have a great big church and have 44,000, and it's just psychobabble. But you and I both know that that doesn't always do what's necessary in terms of the declaration of the Word. Right. So the godly leader recognizes that, and he's willing to teach not dodging difficult truth. Hmm. What are some of the truths that Paul was talking about? I think I can sort of summarize a few of them by the reading of Ephesus, which he later wrote to, his, to this church. He begins by talking about the doctrine of God's sovereignty and election. How many of you know that's not an easy task to preach? That was in chapter 1. Then he goes on to talk about human depravity. Preach that on Sunday morning. Put that on your billboard. We're going to talk about human depravity today. Glory to God. Everybody tune in. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. And because of this, salvation is totally from God's grace and not from our merit or works. And then he shows how, how the wall of separation is built between the Jews and the Gentiles. And that's all about a socio socioeconomic barrier that we don't really want to talk about from the pulpits of America today. Hmm. Then he later talks about the role and relationship of husband and wife and the godly hierarchy in the family. Sometimes that's hard to swallow and hard to say. And finally, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he talks about spiritual warfare and the principalities and the powers and rulers of darkness and high places. Nobody wants to hear that. But Paul said, I did not hold back any of those hard things because they're profitable to you. All these doctrines level human pride and exalt the cross of, cross of Jesus because they rob man of any basis for pride. People stumble over these truths, but like health food, they are profitable for spiritual health. And so Paul taught them, and so should we as leaders of integrity. Someone gave my wife, Missy, 
uh, some kind of a chocolate bar or something. Uh, it looked like a chocolate bar. It acted like a chocolate bar, but it tasted, a, it tasted like a, a bale of hay mixed with straw, grass, and seeds. I know it was good for me, but I took one bite and spit that dude as far out the back door I could spit it. I know it would have been healthy if I'd eat it instead of that Milky Way or that Snickers. I get it. And I also know that there are some sermons I hear that I would rather spit out the back door. But I need them. And maturing Christians and maturing people of faith, they understand that depth has to happen and that that kind of, that kind of teaching needs to come for us to better ourselves and to be more than we've been and to do more than we've done. Faithful biblical teaching requires practical application that helps people grow in their faith. Paul taught what was profitable or helpful for spiritual growth and health. He warns Timothy about those who teach things that lead to mere speculation and fruitless discussion rather than furthering God's provision, which is by faith in 1 Timothy 1. As he studies the Bible, a faithful preacher, teacher always asks, so what? So what? It's a great question every Sunday afternoon after the sermon is preached. So what? What's the point? What difference should this scripture make in my life and in the lives of those whom I teach? Sound application always comes out of sound interpretation of a biblical text and its context. You should be able to look at your Bible and say, yes, I see that this is what God wants me to do. And a faithful preacher will give his people that opportunity. Well, quickly in closing, a faithful biblical teaching reflects a seriousness about eternal truth. Paul solemnly testified. I wonder why the word says solemnly. He solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance and faith. The word pictures a person under oath in a courtroom solemnly swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Paul realized that the central destiny and the eternal destiny of souls was at stake, and he didn't make his preaching assignment or take it lightly. That is to say, I think there's a lot of room in sermons and teaching and preaching for humor, but it's easy to abuse humor to imbalance. It's so critical that you convey the seriousness of the Word of God. Do it in ways that will appeal to your people. Do it in ways that will help them understand, yes. But whatever you do, never trivialize it. Never trivialize it. This means that a leader primarily serves the Lord, and not only secondarily, he serves the church. He serves the church. He will answer to God someday for how he fulfilled the stewardship entrusted to him. I realize that sometimes a self-willed person will use that as an excuse for being unaccountable to anyone, but his, if his board questions his behavior, he piously answers, I, I don't need to answer to you, I only answer to God. Every board I've ever said that to showed me wrong, proved me wrong. I don't answer to you, I answer to God. Yes, you do answer to us. You see, God has a structure, <laughs> and it's not a free-for-all. Hmm. A godly leader is marked finally by a servant attitude. Biblical teacher, servant attitude. Paul's servant attitude flavors this entire context of Scripture. But he mentions specifically that he was serving the Lord in verse, uh, verse 19 of 20. The word serving is the verb related to the noun bondservant or slave. Paul often referred to himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, Galatians 1, Colossians 1, Titus 1, bond servant, he said. That's how Paul viewed himself. And that's the way every Christian should view him or herself. We're not, we do not belong to ourselves. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. 
That doesn't sell very well in our society either. We should do all that we do to please him as bond servants. And recognize this, bond servant in the hierarchy of slaves, the bond servant was the lowest rung on the ladder. In Paul's generation, the bond servants were the rowers on the bottom deck of the ship. And those rowers rowed unto death. Jeff, I want to tell you something, brother. I'm going to tell you what my daddy told me. When I said, Dad, I think God's calling me to the ministry, he said, if you can do something else, do it. <laughs> then he said, Son, I'm praying for you. I want you to succeed. I want God to highly favor you and bless you, use you mightily. But he said, I'm going to tell you something. Once you get in, you can't get out with grace. This is a lifetime appointment, my friend. This is a lifetime engagement. This isn't, let's see if I can do this. It's not a contract. You're not signing a three-year contract. And once it's over, you're out. This is a lifetime. And that's why we don't take the credentialing process lightly. We commission, we license, so that we can observe. And in that commission, in that licensure, we watch a year or two while they're going through the stages of their training. And if at any point in those stages of training and the watching period, we find an area or a situation or a circumstance or a life issue that we need to caution our candidate on, we'll caution them and put the brakes on. And it's not because we don't like you or love you or want you in ministry. It's because we know that we know that we know in just a few moments when we say the amen to the prayer of credentialing, you're in, brother. You're in. And you get out when you go to glory. Thursday, I'll have lunch or breakfast with a retired pastor. He's 87 years old and he loves Jesus and he's loved the church for 60 some years. And here's what we, he always talks to me about when we meet. We meet somewhat regularly. I'm, I'm not done, Mitch. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm not done. What can I do? How can I serve? Where can I? Well, his health is so failing now that he's really even struggling to say that with any kind of legitimacy. But I know what he's going to say when I sit down to breakfast with him. Where, where can I help? What can I do? You see, how old are you, Jeff? 43. 43. Man, you got 43 more years. You got 43 more years. You got a whole other lifetime to do this ministry that we're ordaining you to do. Why? Because it's a lifetime engagement it's a lifetime engagement serving. This means that a leader primarily serves the Lord and serves the church. But there's a legitimate sense in which a godly leader realizes that he will answer to God and it keeps him from becoming a man pleaser. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, For I am now seeking the favor of men or of God. Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. In this sense, the pleasing of God rather than men allows a godly leader to confront sin when necessary and preach difficult truth when necessary. When a man or woman sees himself or herself as a servant of Jesus, they will take up the towel and basin, as Jesus did, and serve others out of love. Lording it over others in the world will not work. Assuming the posture of servanthood will work. And I want to submit to you that the posture of servanthood and the posture of leadership are one and the same. Please don't think you can ever lead a church that you're not willing to serve. Let's pray. Father God.
We thank you for godly men and women who have felt the call and who are feeling the call. We're thankful, Lord, for the, the call of God. We're thankful for the ordination of the Spirit. And we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity it gives us to minister. Lord, as salvation has come by grace, the gift of ministry comes by grace. None of us worthy of salvation, certainly none of us worthy of ministry. And yet, you call us to both, salvation and service. I pray you'll take your word today, Lord, and emboss it on our heart, and let us not soon forget what it means to be a godly leader. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Mitch. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he was having the, his last supper with his disciples. and They had kind of been discussing some things and perhaps them, they had even been arguing amongst themselves, the disciples. When they arrived at, at the upper room, none of them took the responsibility to wash the other's feet. There weren't any, any servants there, and, and that was the custom that when you entered a house that, that a servant would wash the feet of those who would come. Jesus had been with his disciples now three years. And so as they sat around the table and I'm not sure whether they had eaten first or they were getting ready to eat, Jesus took the basin and he went around and he washed each one of his disciples' feet. And he said to them, I'm doing this to you, and if you don't allow me to do this, you can't have any part with me. But I want you to do this also to the people that you serve. So this evening, I'm going to ask Jeff if, if you'll come up, and uh, I'm going to wash Jeff's feet and charge him then to wash the feet of those that he serves.
It is my privilege to share with you the ordination charge. Jeff, if you and your wife would come and stand with me, please. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning of verse number 1, it says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, Encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Today I want everyone assembled here to understand that the Credentials Committee of West Virginia Ministries of the Church of God has diligently inquired into the soundness of doctrine and the holiness of life of the one that stands before you. And we are convinced of his ability in respect to gifts, learning, dedication, and spiritual experience for this great work as required in God's Word and accordingly required with the Church of God. We therefore present them to you to receive ordination and the laying on of hands. Jeff, to choose the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is a most noble choice. He who aspires to be a minister of Jesus Christ desires a high position. Beloved of the Lord, you have heard the creden from the Credentials Committee, from the Holy Word of God, of the dignity and the importance of ministry whereunto you are called. And now again, we exhort you. Is it gone? Can you hear me now? Yeah. We exhort you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that you be perpetually in remembrance of how great and holy the office unto which you are being ordained. God has called you to his ministry. Your tasks are many. You are to be a messenger, a watchman, a steward of the Lord, an ambassador of Christ. You are to teach, to admonish, to feed the flock over which the Lord has made or will make you an overseer, that they all may be saved through him forever. And now, Jeff, in order that the church here assembled may receive full proof of your determination. And that the charge shall be forever upon you. You will plainly answer, I will, to the questions that the ministry, in the name of God and his church, require of you. Will you promise to be faithful to the high calling of God? I will. Will you believe in the Bible as the holy, inspired word of God? I will. Will you pledge to study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly interpreting the word of truth? I will. Will you promise to live to the highest that you know, to live honorably, intelligently, and as an example in this world so that those who know you will be inspired to be a follower of Christ? I will. Will you promise to expand the strength of hand and mind and soul in an all-out effort to build the kingdom of God in today's world? I will. Will you promise to live so that to the very best of your ability you will personify the love, the purity, the soul burden, the purpose, and the righteousness of the divine Christ? 
I will. Will you promise to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation? I will. Will you promise to be true and faithful to the doctrine, the ideals, and the truth set forth in the word of God and proclaimed by the church of God? I will. It is now here today that we, the ministers of the church of God, therefore charge you to be true to the ministry and to your divine calling all the days of your life. Remember that this is not merely for a day or a year or a decade, but for all of your life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 12 through 16 said this of Timothy, his son in the faith. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Would you please kneel at the altar? For the laying on of hands and prayer of dedication. We ask now that all ordained ministers of the gospel would please come forward to gather around him. We ask for all licensed and commissioned ministers of the gospel, if you are here, would you come and join them at this time? And we also invite anyone else who would like to come forward and show your support for Jeff at this time. Would you come now, please? Get the oil, Pastor. Get that oil there, miss. <clears throat> Jeff, we're going to anoint you just in representation of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we anoint you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we anoint you as well, his wife. Tell me your name, sweetheart. Tarina. Let's pray. Father God, we bow humbly before you as he who has called us, he who has sustained us, he who has equipped us, he who has readied us, and now he who will send us. We humbly bow, Lord, because we recognize that this call is not the call that ministers in the church of god or west virginia ministries has made it's the call that you have made and now we are simply recognizing the call you have already given we recognize that in jeff's life and god we pray in the name of jesus that as he rises from this place of prayer and this prayer of ordination lord that he will walk into the world ready to witness ready to share ready to give ready to be the person you've called him to be in ministry in the kingdom of God. God bless his family, bless his wife. Lord, he doesn't walk alone. He walks alongside of his wife and his family. God, I pray you would anoint her and ready her. Lord, my suspicion is she didn't grow up knowing she'd be a preacher's wife. So God, I pray in Jesus' name, you'll anoint her and you, will God, will give her revelation to be able to help and encourage and support and come alongside in great ways, Lord. God, in moments of discouragement, may she be an encouragement. Amen. In moments of fatigue, may she be rest for his weary life. Lord, in moments of, of doubt, may she be the certainty. Yeah. And Lord, she'll only be those things through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. God, may they walk hand in hand every day, every year for the rest of their lives with the call of God heavy upon them and the burden for souls deeply rooted in their spirit. We love you. We give you thanks and praise for this wonderful moment. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
Now, upon the basis of your commitment to God and your pledged word by the power vested in us by Almighty God and West Virginia Ministries of the Church of God, we do hereby declare for all to hear that you be ordained to the holy ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. Congratulations. And if it's okay here, let's applaud, all right? You may be seated. Brother CJ, I've asked Brother CJ if he would say uh, some words charging us as a congregation to be supportive of Jeff's ministry. I bring you uh, greetings on two fronts from West Virginia State Ministries along with our state pastor, Pastor, pastor Mitchell Birch, and our credentials chair, Pastor Bobby Cook. I'm going to tell a quick story. I'm up in Moundsville and was one of the tour guides of the West Virginia Penitentiary. How many of you were uh, convicts that were that had spent time? At, yeah, I know, Rocky. Uh, oh, put your hand down, man. Don't tell on yourself. I, I, I was privileged to be a tour guide there, and, and on one part of the tour is the old man's column, the OMC, and it used to have an electric fence there. And so at, at that tour, I, I, I demonstratively would lean against the fence, a little tough. And, on one tour, I had a father and a five-year-old little boy. And the five-year-old little boy said, Dad, is that what I think it is? And the dad said, yeah, son, that, that's an electric fence. And, and I saw the little boy look me up and down and see me leaning against it. And he said, Dad, he said, is it on? And the dad said, well, son, if it's on, that is one tough tour guide. <laughs> and that little boy looked at me from the very tip of my toes, very slowly surveyed me, and he said, must not be on. He doesn't look very tough. <laughs> you know, that kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. But you know what? It's not about who I am. And Reverend Jeff, it is not about who you are. It is about whose you are. New Martinsville Church of God, it is not about who you are. 1895, three years before me up the river, oldest established Church of God in West Virginia. George Clayton and his wife Liz floated upon the floating Bethel down the Ohio River, God brought them to this place to do something incredible, and you're a part of that. Reverend Jeff, you are a part of that as well. So I am going to charge you today as part of his ordination. And so if you are a regular attender of New Martinsville Church of God, I'm going to ask that you stand. I'm going to charge you to love Pastor Jeff and his family. What does love mean? Is it a platitude written on Valentine's Day's cards? Is it something that you glibly squeak out of your mouth every now and then? No, 1 Corinthians 13 says love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It keeps no records of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil. And you skip down later and it says of these three, faith, hope, and love, Love is the greatest. New Martinsville Church of God, will you love Reverend Jeff and his family? Yeah. You can respond, we will, since. I charge you to support him. Too many people think that pastors are to do the work. Actually, we got the greatest job. It tells us in Ephesians 4, we are to equip the people of the church to do the ministry. We are to tell you to do the work. Do the work. Will you support him by joining alongside in making the kingdom of God more effective 
Today, I charge you, and if you agree, please say, we will. New Martinsville Church of God, will you protect? Boy, at times, the church can be tough. If you've known a pastor longer than 10 minutes, he's got some scars. <laughs> will you stand up against gossip? Will you not allow any derogatory comments? Will you be a flagship of the defense? Will you today say that is a called man of God? New Martinsville Church of God, will you protect Pastor Jeff? We will. And then the biggest thing, I'm going to ask if you pray. You know, we talk about prayer, we sing about prayer, we preach about prayer. Those aren't questions. Prayer is effective, prayer is powerful. Every one of us, if I went through the sanctuary, would say that prayer has been answered by God. We all know that. The question arises, why do we not pray more? Yes. I am going to encourage you, not just for Pastor Jeff and his family, but also for Pastor Dan. I'm going to encourage you to pray every single day. We are living in a tough time right now. But greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. That's right. We're living in a time of uncertainty, a time of doubt. But there's one way, there's one truth, there's one life, and his name is Jesus. So today, will you pray for Pastor Jeff like you've never prayed before? And if you would do so, please signify that by saying we will. We will. Thank you. Let's remain standing as, as we sing the song, All I Am.
Thank you all for being here this evening and being a part of this. I'm going to say a benediction and I want to invite all of you to uh, the back in the fellowship hall. We'll be having a reception. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus, once again. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for, for Jeff and for Tarina, for his whole family, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing them, and I ask that you would continue to bless them. I pray for your blessing upon on their ministry together. And now, Lord, as we go from this place, help us to live for you in every way. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we serve you. Amen. Amen. God bless you.